Hi there, this is Phil Simborg uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina at the Incredible Carolina Invitational Tournament. I say incredible because they play a modified Swiss. He calls it Southern Swiss, and you get a lot of matches in, and it's really fun. But I'm excited that I'm here with a lot of really, really fine top players uh, from all over the United States. We don't get too many international players to this tournament. But I've got a lot of great players here, and I'm not going to waste it. I'm going to do one of my podcasts by getting some insights from some of these top players. I've got two positions that I think are fascinating. One's cube and one's checker play. This cube position uh, is from a match that I played last night with Sean Garber uh, in the Faster Masters. I was very fortunate to uh, come in second, losing to Jim Hickey, and uh, had a great run for me, uh, and it was fun. Uh, but this position came up, and it's a Q position. And the other position I'm going to show you is one that Steve Sachs sent me that he got right, and I certainly got wrong, and I think lots of people will get it wrong. And I want to get uh, – I'm not so concerned with whether these great players get to play right or wrong because we all miss plays, and, and uh, it can go either way. But what I do want to know is their approach. What is their thinking? How do they evaluate this cube and that checker play? So I'm going to call on a few of these top players that are going to be kind enough to put their – um, reputations on the line a little bit and take a chance and, and be uh, on this video podcast and tell us what we think. And I'm going to start out with my uh, good friend and uh, fellow Beck Emin Learning Center teacher, uh, uh, Dennis Culpepper, who has been uh, a very, very top-ranked player, won many tournaments, uh, certainly beaten me many times. I did get lucky and beat him last night in the Faster Masters, but we have really complicated games and, and they were terrific and he made some incredible plays. Uh, and Dennis, uh, if you go to uh, Grid Gammon, you'll see that he's been one of the top player, if not the top ranked player for a long time there. He's just a terrific player, and you don't see him at that many live tournaments. So I'm going to take advantage of having Dennis here and get his thoughts on these two positions. So I'm going to pause it, put Dennis, uh, give Dennis a chance to look at the position, and tell us what he thinks about these two positions. So uh, you can always pause the recording yourself, by the way, if you want to take more time. Recording. Okay, so Dennis, take it away. Here's a doubling cube position. Uh, set the stage. It's a 13-point match. Blue's holding a two cube. Blue is winning one to nothing, so it's not a real big score thing. Uh, and uh, Blue is thinking about redoubling. It was Sean Garber, and I'm red. Uh, should Blue double? Should I take? What is your approach to this, Dennis? How would you decide what to do here? Well, uh, looking at the pip count, and we can see it here, of course, during a match you'd have to count it up, but we fortunately we have the pip count here at 17. It's pretty difficult to play a back game um, with only 17 points or pips difference. Now, of course, if uh, Blue throws a two or four, he, uh, the difference goes up a lot more because you're sending a guy back 20, 20 pips plus your roll, so it could easily swing uh, 30 more pips. But uh, my thoughts are if he gets out with a six, a single six um, from the 22-point it doesn't hit, that your timing is going to be so bad, it, it's just going to be difficult to, uh, um, you don't win enough games from that position. And hitting, you may collapse. So I wasn't sure it was a take. So since I'm not sure it was a take, I would be um, prone to double this kind of position at this score, of course. So one of the things I hated most about Blue's position was that uh, the spare on his four point. Um, backing it up would be a huge improvement in his game, but it is where it is, and um, that's part of uh, – still part of my decision was it still was a pass from there. Okay, so you've applied Woolsey's law. You you looked at it from Red's standpoint. You weren't sure it's a take, so for sure it's a double. And if you were Red, you probably would pass or take. What would you do? I would probably – I would probably pass. Um, okay. I think you get enough passes um, uh, doubling this. I um, don't know. No, you can look at the numbers and find out how often you have to get a pass to make it a correct, um, correct double. But, uh, uh -huh. you know, I would, uh, I would probably pass this probably. Okay. So let's look at the answer. And the answer is it's a, it's a fairly sizable take. Uh, and uh, when I say fairly sizable, a, a .10 cube error is really not anywhere near as big an error as a .10 checker play error, and a lot of the top players in the world will confirm this right away. This is not what I would call it, even though XG calls it a blunder because it's .08. That's the amount of equity you're giving away. These kinds of mistakes are easy to make in cube play, and I did take the cube. Now, Dennis, you were saying that one of the things you don't like about Blue's position is this checker, and you said if it was a little more timing, it might be different. Let's take that checker, and you suggested this earlier, and put it back a little bit. And let's see if this changes the decision. By the way, 
if you're watching this, you can pause the video. What do you think happens now? We know this is better for blue. We know for sure it's a double. Uh, how does it affect the cube decision? Would that turn uh, 0.10 take into a pass? What do you think? And I think you'd be surprised to see it becomes a pass. Just two pips of timing and having a checker in a better position, that's how volatile this is, and that's why a 0.10 error isn't that much. Dennis, any more thoughts on this position? Well, it's, it's what it allows you to do is uh, possibly keep the prime for longer, maybe five or six rolls down the game, because maybe you escape a checker and you're getting ready to collapse and you're able to play a 3-2 a or a 4-1 and maybe bury the checker to the ace point and, or or more numbers to attack him if he runs, uh, bigger numbers to attack him with instead of ones. I hear you. So I wonder, Phil, move it up back just one to see is that kind of does that split the difference? So uh, um, yeah, to the five point, what happens there? Well, it probably splits the difference, like you said. I bet you this is borderline or maybe a small take, probably a small take. And what Dennis is doing here is something that I see all great players do. You look at variations to help you understand where you were wrong or right in the first position. By making slight changes, you can see how it changes the, the thought. And, it, and Dennis is right. It becomes a fairly small take, 5.052. It's split the difference. It was a 10% uh, uh -huh. take, then it become a pass. You move it up, it, it becomes a 5%. Uh -huh. So uh, I think... Just backgammon in general, just um, looking at a position say, oh, I should have taken that or I should have passed that, then go on to the next one really doesn't help you. If you slow down, spend a little more time really trying to understand why it's a take or a pass or why it's a double when you didn't think it was, um, you'll get – your results would be better quicker. You'll learn more if you slow down and really try to understand what's going on by moving – the check us around like we're doing right here. This uh, is very important. And this is exactly what Dennis is going to be doing in our boot camp in Cyprus. He's working with Mochi and Michi and myself and others uh, in a boot camp in Cyprus <laughs> and uh, possibly other uh, areas around the world where we're going to really get into detail sitting down with the computer and with the board and with individual players and working on these things and showing you how to improve your tactics. One of the, my favorite sayings is a good teacher teaches himself out of a job we're going to teach people how to learn on their own like Dennis is doing right here. Thanks, Dennis. Now we're going to look at a uh, – I'm going to pause the video and we're going to look at a checker play that uh, I think is very interesting that Steve Sachs gave us. So hold on. We'll, we'll be right back. Okay. Now we are uh, looking at a money game uh, checker play. Uh, blue is holding a two cube and red has a one one to play. Steve Sachs sent me this partially because he thought it was a really neat play, but also because he got the play right. And he didn't think I would, and he was right. I got it wrong. But I want to see what Dennis does with this and a few other top players that we're going to interview today, and it'll help you maybe in your decision on how to approach checker plays. So, Dennis, take it away. What's your thoughts on this play? Okay, the um, – um, for me, I would make the four point six to four, then consider switching to the three – point, um, putting two up, you have six, seven, eight, nine guys in the zone. I, I, I just fear that um, blue is going to anchor too often, either by um, throwing the double twos or four, then hitting back and making the four point. I would tend to play this position uh, pure and try to make the eight point, because uh, when blue comes in, if you can make the eight point, you've, you've got four guys behind a five prime. So I could hit over on uh, my 23 point, but that, uh, that checker can actually come back to haunt me if he double anchors and can run that check around and create a prime with it. So I'm more interested in priming him and not so worried about getting primed myself. So the best way to make the eight, eight point, which is the point you want next, is 13 to 11. That gives you a triple cover. And if he comes out and hits with a five, that gives you a triple return shot. So once you make the eight point, you now have your guys over there poised for the point you want next, which is your nine, or possibly, yeah, move, move it down there. And you so this, see, is your, this is your play? This is, this is my play. And once you make the nine, the eight point, then you're poised to slot the back of the prime or attack, depending on what the dice uh, allow you to do. So, yeah, that would be my play right there. Okay, so you chose the priming game plan as opposed to the blitzing or hitting game plan. 
a, a blitzing game plan would be to switch and make the three points so that he can't anchor, which I have to admit was my play, and it's wrong, uh, and hope he doesn't anchor. And uh, 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 the other play uh, is, a, is a massive hitting play where you hit this checker as well, which uh, I also was very tempted to do because it wins more gamuts. Uh, so I'm going to show you the answer rolled out. Uh, Steve rolled it out, and here it is. And Dennis nailed it. Uh, and again, so did Steve Sachs. And making the, uh, the three-point, as you can see, is uh, not a horrible play, but it's wrong. It's clearly wrong by .065. And hitting the other checker on the 23 is a, is a blunder. It's a real big error. And I guarantee you many, many people would do that. In fact, I know people who might even hit twice. Might hit this checker and this checker trying to go for uh, the big uh, gammon. But uh, like Dennis said, uh, he thought nine checkers in the zone. And that's important to count. That helped him decide on his priming game plan as opposed to a blitzing game plan. So I questioned Dennis's thinking there. And I took another checker put it in the zone, even though it didn't put another builder on a new point. I put another checker here in the zone, and now it becomes almost right. It's very, very close, as you can see, to actually go for the blitzing play. The number of checkers in the zone would change your game plan to flip to, to where you – and why does it change your game plan, Dennis? Why don't you tell us why? Well, now you have enough guys, if you switch, to probably make the four point naturally, or if he throws one there to um, – to go ahead and attack them and uh, very likely end up making the four point in the next few rolls. So you want to get more gammons. If you drive him back, you, he may uh, not double anchor at all. If you um, just let him roll from here, he's going to throw a three immediately, um, plus double ones, um, two, one. You know, he's got uh, 14, 15 rolls uh, to double anchor right now. But if you create your prime, then those double anchoring numbers aren't, aren't but so good. And back again on the uh, the blot on the 23 point. If the worst flaw in Blue's game right now is that solo checker hung out to dry on the on the Blue's two point over there. So by you hitting that, you recirculate that and add it back as a soldier to come back around when he's almost dead where he is. So you, you don't want to touch that checker back on the 23 point. But um, I think what, what Dennis is uh, is saying in another in another way is is that if you end up making succeeding with your prime and if blue does end up with a back game which is quite possible you could end up with a one three game or a one two game or a back game or two three game uh later on if you do leave that shot that checker he's got on the two point is a horrible liability because he either has to cover it and have the lousy two point made or have a block there if you get hit uh bearing in against the back game so why take away uh, his worst feature and help him and help him with his timing uh, yes, it will, may give you more gammons uh, in the long run, but if it costs you games, remember, in a money game, gammons are only half as important. They're only worth 0.5. Uh, thank you, Dennis. A great analysis on both. I'm going to uh, talk to some other uh, uh, really, really top players here and see if they have some different perspectives, and I just think it'll be fun to see how other people approach this. I will uh, see you throughout the rest of the tournament. Take it easy. Okay. Thanks, uh, Thanks for sharing these problems, Phil. Mm -hmm.